when targeted therapies work, often they recur in the brain. And our next speaker, Dr. Priscilla Bratzianos from Mass General, is also very focused in sampling brain metastases and trying to understand what drives metastases in the brain. So. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present here today. I apologize, I have a cold, so apologize if my voice gives up. So today I'm going to talk about the genomics of brain tumors, and I'm gonna show you the power of genomics and its immediate impact on clinical paradigms in three different brain tumors, meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, and brain metastases. So why is understanding the genomics of brain tumors important? Well, you all know about precision medicine and cancer. What does precision medicine mean? It means we can identify which patients will benefit from specific treatment opportunities by biopsying cancer samples and then targeting specific genetic alterations. And we all know that in the last 10 or 15 years, this has revolutionized the management of many different cancers, including breast cancers, lung cancers, and melanoma. However, the genomics of many types of brain tumors still remain poorly understood. And this limited understanding of these genetic changes has hampered the development of novel therapeutics. So we focused our work on three understudied brain tumors. So let me start with meningiomas. So meningiomas are the most common primary brain tumor. Historically, surgery and radiation are the primary modalities used to treat meningiomas. However, once surgery and radiation have failed, there is no effective medical therapy. And prior to 2013, we did not understand the molecular drivers of these tumors. So using next-generation sequencing technologies, we performed the first comprehensive genomic characterization of meningiomas with the goal to identify new therapeutic targets. And surprisingly, we found significant, clinically significant alterations in smoothened AKT1 and NF2, which were all mutually exclusive from each other. So as you all know, smoothened is a member of the hedgehog signaling pathway, Mutations in this pathway have been reported in basal cell carcinoma and medulloblastomas, and smoothen inhibitors are FDA approved for the management of basal cell carcinoma. AKT1 is a member of the PI3 kinase pathway, and it's activated in a number of cancers. And inhibitors to AKT1 are in clinical trials in other cancers. And NF2 mutations occur in breast cancers, mesotheliomas, and other cancers. And approximately 50% of meningiomas had alterations in NF2. As these are clinically actionable mutations, meaning there are drugs that target them, does this represent a new paradigm shift for meningiomas? Will we be looking for mutations in meningiomas and treating accordingly? And based on these data, we've now started a national multi-center clinical trial in meningiomas sponsored by the NCI cooperative group, The Alliance. And if meningiomas have a smoothened mutation, they'll receive a smoothened inhibitor, an AKT mutation, an AKT inhibitor, and an NF2 mutation, a FAC inhibitor. We're now actively enrolling patients, and more than 300 hospitals have been activated now throughout the US to enroll patients. So this is the first national precision medicine trial in brain tumors. And we'll also be incorporating biopsies and advanced imaging tools to identify biomarkers of response and resistance to therapy. So applying now the same paradigm to other tumors. So I'm going from one of the most common primary brain tumors to one of the rarest. Craniopharyngiomas are a rare brain tumor in children and adults, and these tumors can be clinically devastating because they impinge upon critical structures in the brain, including the optic chiasm and the pituitary. And surgery for these tumors is actually quite challenging and can lead to lifelong permanent neurological sequelae. And once surgery and radiation fail, there is no effective medical therapy like meningiomas. So recently, using next-generation sequencing technologies, we performed the first genomic characterization of craniopharyngiomas in collaboration with many in this room, including Sandro Sonagata here. And we found that one subtype of craniopharyngiomas, the adamantinomatous, were driven by beta-catenin mutations, and the other subtype, papillary, were driven by BRAF V600E mutations, which are the same mutations that have been described in melanoma. And these mutations were mutually exclusive and clonal in each subtype. And we recently had the opportunity to apply this to clinical care and to treat a patient with a papillary craniopharyngioma. So a 38-year-old patient presented to our institution at Mass General requiring four urgent neurosurgeries over the span of three months for an aggressive craniopharyngioma that kept recurring. Based on, his, on our data, we then tested his tumor for BRAF, and he indeed harbored the mutation. On his fifth admission to MGH, he presented with this scan, which showed a large craniopharyngioma. 
Instead of treating them with surgery, we then initiated a BRAF inhibitor. By day 17 of therapy, his tumor had shrunk by more than 50%. And by day 34 of therapy, his tumor had shrunk by more than 85%, and his clinical status had dramatically improved. This is the first time that a response has been demonstrated in craniopharyngiomas like this. So this has also now led to an NCI-sponsored clinical trial, which will open later this year. So we're now applying similar genomic techniques to understand the evolution of metastatic disease to the brain, which is a much more complex question. So brain metastases, as you all know, are an unmet clinical need in oncology. So two to 300,000 patients in the US per year are diagnosed with brain metastases. And the incidence is rising as patients are living longer and systemic therapies are improving. And 50% of patients with brain metastases will die of their brain metastases. And we often observed a divergence of a therapeutic response in brain metastases and extracranial sites. And we have a limited understanding of how brain metastases genetically evolve from their primary tumors. And clinical decisions for brain metastases are often made by targeting genetic alterations in the primary tumor. So the question is, can we rely on a primary tumor biopsy to make decisions about clinical care for brain metastases patients? To answer this question, we've now created one of the largest tumor banks in the world with more than 1,000 brain metastases matched with primary tissue, and we're building an international network of collaborators to answer this question. We've now genomically characterized the first 100 brain metastases matched with primary tissue with the goal to understand the evolutionary genomic processes within the brain. And in collaboration with our colleagues at the Broad Institute, we've now built novel analytic tools to map the evolutionary relationship for each match metastasis and primary tumor with phylogenetic trees. So this is an example here of a phylogenetic tree of a patient with a renal cell carcinoma who developed a brain metastasis synchronously with the primary tumor. So the length of the line here represents the number of mutations. The color represents where the mutations occur. So gray shared by both the brain metastasis and the primary tumor, red exclusive to the brain metastasis, and blue exclusive to the primary tumor. In this case, the brain metastasis and the primary tumor shared a common ancestor with VHL and mTOR, and the brain metastasis had additional clinically significant genetic alterations, including a hotspot PIK3CA mutation. And across all cases we looked at, we saw this pattern of divergent or branched evolution, whereby we detected some common mutations in both the brain metastasis and the primary tumor, but further and significant evolution within the brain metastasis and within the primary tumor. Notably, more than 50% of brain metastases had clinically significant alterations that were not detected in the clinically sampled primary tumor. So how is this important clinically? If one were to exclusively sample the primary tumor, one may miss potentially actionable alterations in the brain. Moreover, patients will often develop progressive brain metastases in the setting of their extracranial disease beating under good control with existing chemotherapies or targeted therapies. The observations presented here suggest that additional oncogenic alterations may be present in brain metastases and might contribute to this divergence of therapeutic responses observed in brain metastases and extracranial sites. So the next question, were there common pathways across our cohort of brain metastases? Indeed, the most common alterations were those associated with sensitivity to CDK inhibitors. So here's a list of genes that were altered in this category. Each column represents a different brain metastasis sample. So 51% of cases across all histologies had alterations associated with sensitivity to CDK inhibitors. These included CDK4-6 amplifications or loss of CDK and 2A. Mutations affecting the PI3 kinase pathway were also frequent, with 43% of cases harboring alterations associated with sensitivity to PI3 kinase inhibitors. So these represent potential opportunities for clinical trials in brain metastases patients. So now we're moving forward with a genomically guided brain metastasis trial. We're starting a pilot at Mass General Hospital within the next two months. And I'd actually be thrilled to partner with industry for this brain metastasis trial, as well as to collaborate to study the several hundred additional brain metastasis trials, or brain metastasis patients. So in conclusion, genomics can transform clinical paradigms. And mapping genomic profiles of primary and metastatic brain tumors is critical for uncovering therapeutic targets. Thank you.